Um, dear guests and dear participants, welcome to the DPAM seminar, uh, I mean webinar during these pandemic times. Uh, uh, I, I am I am listening my my voice. Okay, yeah, I fix it. Uh, during the pandemic times, today we have uh, four distinguished participants, uh, both in Turkey and in in, in US. Uh, I, I want to say to welcome of them, uh, Professor Ahmed Han Kasım Han, Doctor. Jehun Çiçekçi, uh, Mr. Sigut Nobauer, and Mr. Jason Epstein. Uh, we will talk about uh, Israel's new position, new alliances, and the foreign policy, and also Israel's uh, new direction in the Middle East, East Mediterranean region, and also in the Middle East. And the status quo is uh, getting changing nowadays. The, is the Israel is also an uh, important figure in, in all Middle East policies and both also the, the, the uh, East Mediterranean region. And uh, uh, we have to investigate uh, such a big uh, party in the region. And we will try to illustrate what change, what, what, what will change, and what the dimension of the, these changes. And uh, we can start first section with uh, 15 minutes for the, each participant, and then the second section for the 10 minutes uh, that can be uh, changed for the, the questions coming from our the audience or, or the, the comments for the another participant, uh, we will manage this this debate and uh, this webinar like that. Uh, we can start with the Dr. Jehun Chichekchi uh, in the general situation in the Eastern Mediterranean region and the uh, Israel uh, the new tendencies in the Israel foreign policy and also. Uh, from uh, because of the, his uh, Turkish uh, background, and he can uh, argue that the, the Israelis and Turkey new relations and uh, the, the, some perspective about them. Uh, Doctor Jehun Çiçekçi, uh, we can we can uh, hear you and, and let's start. Thank you very much, Selman Hocam. Uh, I'm very happy. I'm very glad to be here with you. Uh, uh, and thanks uh, a lot for you to inviting me to this uh, discussion. Uh, I am trying to analyze uh, the Israel's uh, East Med policy, uh, especially uh, in a comparative perspective with the uh, 90s. Uh, because 90s and uh, 2010s uh, are, uh, are similar periods but uh, we can we can easily notice that uh, Israel is a interchangeable actor in this uh, triangular relationship in the in the East Med uh, uh, within the uh, Greece, uh, Turkey, and also Israel. Uh, first of all, <clears throat> I'd like to uh, I would like to underline the uh, main uh, approach uh, that, that uh, drive the Israeli foreign policy towards the uh, East Met. Uh, I, I, I can divide into two parts uh, the East Met policy of Israel. Uh, first one uh, is a, a, a security oriented approach. Uh, I, I can ar argue that uh, Israel's foreign policy uh, would be derived one by. Uh, this one uh, is also about the uh, 90s uh, and also uh, 2010s uh, because there is a uh, there's there's a tendency that uh, Israel uh, is aligning with the Greece and also uh, southern Cyprus uh, from the big, very beginnings of the uh, 2010s uh, with the uh, with the exploration of the uh, uh, massive 
gas, uh, natural gas reserves. Uh, today, after 10 years, today uh, we, we we can we can easily we can easily notice that there's uh, there's much more than a, a natural gas uh, or energy uh, partnership. And today uh, we can easily we can easily claim that Israel is aligned with the Greece and Southern Cyprus to confront uh, Turkey in the in the region, in the, uh, especially in East Map. However, when we look at when we have a look at uh, 90, 1990s, uh, this trend is uh, is on the backward, like uh, Turkey and uh, Israel. Uh, uh, had an had an alliance uh, against uh, ma mainly against mainly S Syria and Iran uh, in the in the 1996. Uh, it's it was a it was a process uh, of that uh, countries uh, included. Uh, I mentioned uh, also Greece was one of the uh, main threats uh, against the Turkish interests in the region uh, in the 1990s and turkey uh, balanced uh, gr greek uh, efforts to confront him uh, herself uh, balancing uh, greece with the uh, with the with allying with uh, israel uh, at, at the times uh, but today uh, as i mentioned before uh, from the very beginning of the 2010s, uh, we can easily say that uh, now Israel is uh, allying and also Greece is allying Israel uh, against the Turkish interests and Turkish presence in the region. Uh, one of the one of the perspectives uh, we can we can claim that uh, security oriented approach is that, and also uh, the second one. Uh, is about also uh, energy diplomacy. Energy diplomacy uh, is uh, so important for uh, Israel today, uh, but again, uh, for its uh, diplomatic, uh, for uh, again, uh, its diplomatic uh, efforts, diplomatic presence uh, around the region, and also diplomatic recognition uh, around the region, uh, and also its its relations, uh, its relation upgrading its relations uh, in EU. Uh, for example, uh, with uh, with uh, aligning with Greece and Southern Cyprus, uh, both of them uh, are uh, EU members. You know, uh, with with this with this move, Israel uh, is aiming legitimizing its positions in in EU po policy circles. Uh, one one of the main aims uh, of the uh, Israeli foreign policy is that, uh, and also. Uh, with uh, gas agreements uh, with uh, Egypt and Jordan, uh, especially in 2018 with Egypt, uh, these two uh, agreements are also uh, very important, very significant moves uh, for Israeli foreign policy to strengthen its relations around its uh, near, near abroad. Uh, and the third one, you know, uh, a, a forum uh, was built up uh, as uh, namely uh, East Met Gas Forum uh, and also Israel is a par participant there uh, this uh, this kind of this kind of regional organizations are also uh, very beneficial uh, for Israel foreign policy to uh, diplomatically uh, attractive uh, diplomatically recognized uh, and also this East Met Gas Forum is a part of energy diplomacy of Israel, and it's it's uh, it's I'm, I'm sure that it's uh, Israel's also uh, it's in, in in Israel's benefits. Uh, so, uh, what can I add to my speech? Uh, I am looking to my notes. Uh, yeah, uh, for example, uh, today I said in the in the in the beginning of my speech uh, the security oriented approach uh, that Israel and Greece uh, and also southern Cyprus uh, are moving in a uh, alliance formation uh, today uh, 
uh, because uh, there is some similarities between uh, also Turkey and uh, Turkey and Greece. Uh, Turkey, uh, not a, maybe not a EU member, but Greece also a EU member and also a NATO member. Uh, and these these two uh, these two qualifications of Greece uh, are also uh, so facilitator for Israeli foreign policy uh, uh, approaching rapprochement with the Greece, and also uh, uh, air force maneuvers uh, is a is a part of this uh, alliance. Uh, Israel uh, is using the Greece territory to. Uh, uh, to have uh, air force maneuvers there, and also uh, like uh, in uh, like uh, in Turkish uh, soil uh, in 1990s, and these are uh, these are the uh, main main uh, issues between between the uh, Israel and Greece and also uh, Turkey uh, relations, and also Israel uh, make a um, ma ma Israel, Israel and Greece allied uh, for uh, against the uh, Turkish revisionism, so-called Turkish revisionism uh, around the region. Uh, yes, uh, it's okay for me now. Uh, maybe I can add some words uh, okay. in the second round, okay? Okay, thank you, Dr. Çiçekçi. Uh, the, Dr. Çiçekçi uh, stated the issues in the Eastern Medi Mediterranean uh, especially based on uh, Israel, Greece, and Turkey as a, a security-based issues. And he also labeled uh, Turkey-Israel relations and also uh, ISMED uh, forums positions through in the in the perspective on the uh, in the perspective on the uh, security studies in the region. And he tried to to uh, illustrate uh, a general frame of the issues among uh, Greece as an EU member state, uh, Israel and, and, and Turkey. Maybe in the, in the second section, uh, he will uh, help us to, to understand uh, the relations uh, between the Israeli and the Palestine in the based on the Eastern Mediterranean and also uh, Israeli-Russian relations, which uh, and they, their effects in in the, in the Eastern Mediterranean, because the, the, the these uh, other two parts also related with the security in the in the, in the Israel foreign policy. We uh, thank you, uh, Doctor, and we can continue uh, with the uh, Mr. No Bauer. And we know uh, he has published a brand new book about the uh, Gulf states and Israel relations. They are improving. And we talk about the security issues in the Eastern Mediterranean uh, region, but we will talk about the, some peace process in the Gulf region. And, uh, and we also should uh, uh, describe the, these tea tutor and uh, peace and war and conflict and the agreement, what the uh, uh, Israeli relations uh, bring us to, to Eastern Mediterranean, Israeli relations with the Gulf region, uh, in the, the effects of this, these relations through the Middle East. Uh, Mr. Nobauer, uh, could you... Uh, illuminate us for this uh, section. Thank you very much um, for hosting me today and uh, marhaba to everybody. Um, I have had the great privilege of traveling to Turkey uh, on a regular basis over the past 20 years. In fact, I was supposed to visit Istanbul and Ankara right as the COVID-19 pandemic broke out. But unfortunately, I had to cancel it last minute. But I look forward as always to visiting Turkey soon again. Thank you to my dear friend uh, Ahmed Iskan for inviting me to join you and your distinguished colleagues. It is nice to see my friend Jason Epstein again. I have known Jason for almost 20 years. 
and he's a trailblazer when it comes to the U.S. Turkish Israel nexus, and uh, he's the real expert when it comes to the Eastern uh, Mediterranean. My focus is, of course, the Gulf region, and I have been focusing on on Gulf issues for the past decade, and. Uh, it is only over the past uh, several years that we have seen the relationship between Israel and, and the various Gulf states come out into the open. And uh, I'd like to provide some context um, about that. Uh, since today's topic is the normalization agreement between the United Arab Emirates and Israel and between Bahrain and Israel, formerly known as the Abraham Accords, let me begin my remarks by focusing on the Gulf crisis of 2017. While the crisis erupted in June uh, 2017, when the UAE, Saudi Arabia, Bahrain, and Egypt imposed a blockade on Qatar over its alleged support for Hamas and terrorism, Turkey, Iran, and yes, Israel, um, together for various reasons, played decisive roles in preventing the Gulf region and to prevent uh, the Gulf standup from turning into a hot um, conflict. Turkey's role in the form of President Recep um, Tayyip Erdogan's pronounced support for Qatar is well known. So too is Iran's critical role in preventing Qatar's economy from collapsing by opening up its airspace for goods and services, including for food and vegetables during the early stages of the blockade. But what is less understood, however, is that Israel too played a decisive role in stabilizing the conflict by quietly extending Doha a diplomatic lifeline by accelerating um, the reconstruction in Gaza. The details are included in my new book, which is entitled The Gulf Region in Israel, Old Struggles, New Alliances, which was published only uh, weeks before the Abraham Accord. At the same time, Israel has strengthened its de facto strategic partnership with the UAE. And um, during this crisis, Qatar's regional nemesis as the relationship has since moved out of the shadows and uh, to a formal peace agreement by strengthening its relationship with Abu Dhabi while at the same time extending uh, Doha a hand in peace, Israel skillfully established itself in the process as an unlikely peacemaker. And Qatar, um, had deployed a similar strategy during the uh, immediate aftermath of the 2016 failed coup against President Erdogan when it offered to mediate between Turkey and the United Arab Emirates after the Turkish leader had accused Abu Dhabi of supporting his ouster. Qatar's twin goals were at the time to demonstrate solidarity with Turkey, a strategic partner, while at the same time use the proposed mediation effort to improve its own relationship with the UAE. But let me return back to the Abraham's Accords. From Israel's perspective, preserving the peace and stability um, in the Gulf region remains a top priority, given that Iran is Israel's principal strategic threat. In my view, the Abraham Accords is a legitimate bilateral peace agreement between Israel and the UAE and between Israel and Bahrain. And the agreements do not come at the expense of the Palestinians or at anyone else. I don't believe that the Palestinians have been neglected, as some have argued. Abu Dhabi and Manama, um, along with um, other Gulf countries, will continue to advocate for the Palestinians in their respective dealings with Jerusalem. The Arab Peace Initiative was always a starting point for negotiations and not a take it or leave it ultimatum. Bahrain's former foreign minister once told me, and I agree with him, the Arab Peace Initiative will continue to be part of the conversation. Just as the Abraham's Accords are not coming at the expense of anyone, including Turkey, uh, my sense is that Israel supports the ongoing diplomatic efforts to de-escalate tensions in the Eastern Mediterranean, Turkey and Israel. We should not forget, uh, not only enjoy full diplomatic relations, but the two countries are natural allies. My sense is that tensions between the two countries are limited to the leadership level, but that all the ingredients for a friendly and prosperous relationship are indeed in place despite recent rhetorical skirmishes. Once again, thank you, Ahmed, for inviting me to join your distinguished panels and to shukri lai to them. Mr. Nobauer, thank you so much for your uh, precious comments. And also, the I, I, I really like your last comments and uh, we will go forward on it. Uh, the Turkey and Israel as a nation, na natural uh, ally. Uh, you mentioned about that. And also uh, in, in second section, uh, we will also continue. I, 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 really, I really want to open the, the topic about 
uh, Israeli Qatar relations uh, because we uh, we saw that the, the last mediation of the Qatar between uh, Hamas and Israel, and also you mentioned about it, and and also mention about uh, the good relations with the Turkeys and the Qatars. Uh, it, it will uh, could it be, be uh, uh, advantage for two parties, uh, which are Turkey and Israel, to promote uh, new new agreements and also uh, the effects in the Eastern Mediterranean. Thank you so much for your uh, comments again. Uh, this term uh, will be for the uh, Mr. Jason, Jason Epstein and be uh, hear from him the, the Israeli foreign policies, uh, new fundamentals, because the old fundamentals are changed uh, and status quo change. Uh, we want to to hear from him, especially the Turkey. Uh, I'm sorry, the, the 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 Israeli foreign policy throughout the new foreign policy through the the Middle East, especially Turkey, and also the 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 triangle. Uh, uh, and could you explain the triangle of the U.S., Israel, and Turkey relations? Thank you, Epstein. Uh, you can continue. Well, thank you so much. Thank you to everyone at DPOM and to uh, my colleagues on the panel. And uh, Sigurd, thank you for those kind words. You uh, said them just as I had written them up, and uh, uh, it's always appreciated. Thank you. Um, so I, 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 I think um, it's important to at least begin the conversation by recognizing um, the loss um, yesterday of Jack uh, Kamhi. Um, a business legend in Turkey, um, a leader in the Turkish Jewish community, someone who did so much um, to highlight the Turkish Jewish experience and, and also Turkish uh, Jewish diaspora relations. And I think we lost, again, I think we lost a legend uh, yesterday. Um, so um, uh, there, there, there are, you know, the ties that exist today are in no small part to the tireless efforts of people uh, like Mr. Kami. And, um, and so I, I hope that, uh, that, that, that we can uh, remember, remember his memory fondly. Um, so, um, you know, these Zoom events are, are very fascinating. Um, I, I, I'm unsure whether my presentation will go another five minutes or 35 minutes. I hope that I will be um, taken to task if it's the latter. Um, but um, I, I do want to highlight uh, that I represented, I was part of the Turkish Embassy in Washington's public relations team um, from 2002 through 2007. And I've also, rec um, I've also represented the Turkish Republic of Northern Cyprus in the United States. And uh, even though those, um, even though uh, those assignments um, uh, consulting for the embassy and by extension, the judiciary. I hope it's understood that uh, there's always a component, not just uh, between um, the United States and Turkey, but of course the triangular, the triangle relationship of US, Turkey, Israel. Um, we can go back to 1949, of course, where um, Turkey became the first uh, Muslim majority country to recognize the state of Israel. We can then fast forward to the Ozal era, where the strategic relationship really got underway, uh, to perhaps the mid-1990s when Tanchu Chiller was, uh, was prime minister, and uh, relations then exploded, not just, be, not just in terms of strategic relations, but also economic, social, and, and, and diplomatic ties. Um, and of course, for um, uh, while currently all we hear about are tensions between Turkey and Israel. Uh, we must remember that the, uh, at least through uh, uh, then Prime Minister Erdogan's first term, uh, relations not only remained, uh, remained a positive, but in many respects strengthened further. Uh, in you know, uh, Sigurd made an interesting point earlier. 
that I think uh, should be emphasized a little more, and that is of the Palestinian cause. And um, he makes an interesting point about what may be priorities for, for the UAE and Bahrain uh, in terms of, of, of Palestinians. Uh, but what I think many uh, watchers of, of, of Israeli foreign policy uh, might not understand, uh, at least not instinctively, is that the strong ties between Turkey and Israel are built, um, are built uh, based on Israeli-Palestinian communication, uh, negotiations, uh, cooperation. Uh, you know, the, 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 uh, the great strides that were made in the 1990s, it's no accident that came immediately after Oslo. And uh, then the, the, the Israeli-Jordanian peace agreement. And the first, bump in the, the first bumps in the road were really during the second intifada uh, around uh, 20, 20, uh, 2002. So uh, sometimes, we, sometimes we forget that, the, that, that, that as, as sometimes we, we look back so fondly on, 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 on the bilateral relationship and, 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 and the opportunities there uh, connected to the United States, uh, that we lose sight of the fact that they were in many respects predicated on Israeli-Palestinian uh, progress on peace talks and, and, and uh, other forms of cooperation. Um, we also, I, I, I think it's important to, um, uh, to note that back in the 1990s, Israel did not have much of a relationship with uh, Greece, with South Cyprus, uh, Cyprus, South Cyprus, uh, choose your nomenclature. Um, it was, there was a cold peace with Egypt um, even, uh, it, during the uh, later Mubarak years, uh, certainly not much in the way of economic, uh, economic cooperation. Uh, Turkey played a very, very important role um, on the issues just described before, uh, an economic, uh, the economic ties, the the cultural ties. Um, while Turkey wasn't necessarily a reliable vote in the United Nations, Turkey, Turkey was very helpful in other diplomatic uh, endeavors. And of course, you know, the Israeli and, 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 and Turkish uh, defense communities and intelligence communities um, were, were, I mean, these were very intimate ties. I also mentioned, of course, that during the first uh, first several years of the Erdogan uh, administration, that the uh, that the relationship, in many respects, grew grew uh, grew as well. Uh, there may have been some uh, may have been some public comments that were very unhelpful, and there were some perhaps some worrying uh, some 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 uh, signs that 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 worried that worried. Um, that may have worried Israeli policymakers. For example, the issue of of when Hamas was e elected to lead in Gaza, and, uh, and 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 the immediate aftermath of that, it really wasn't until Operation Cast Lead, the Israeli um, incursion into Gaza in 2008, that we could see that the that that the bilateral relationship was uh, was deteriorating. Uh, that uh, that then continued um, that continued uh, with the Davos incident involving. Uh, Shimon Peres and Erdogan. It uh, the Mavi Marmara, of course, is what everyone. The Mavi Marmara incident uh, tragedy uh, is, is is certainly is certainly another uh, a perhaps a watershed moment, or at least publicly. But but uh, but there were signs, uh, certainly signs before that. Uh, it's also important to to keep in mind that during the um, uh, during the Obama uh, during the Obama administration. Uh, there were signs that the the United States was no longer going to play such a uh, uh, such a leadership role, um, and so uh, you know that was a time when Israel needed to uh, look for new friends, and um, despite the Obama administration's efforts to promote reconciliation between uh, Israel and and uh, Turkey. Uh, Really, it was it, it, ties had deteriorated to such an extent that you know, Israel was 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 compelled 
to look as far away as China, of course. Um, there were several visits to Moscow, uh, but also the, the um, uh, Greece and, and, and South Cyprus and, 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 uh, and later after uh, Sisi came to power in Egypt, uh, filled the vacuum. It's also uh, worth noting that, that while the American Jewish uh, organizations had been very supportive of, of this relationship between Israel and Turkey, and, and of course the, the triangular relationship, that as, as, it, as relations deteriorated between uh, uh, Jerusalem and Ankara, it's not surprising that uh, American Jewish support did as well. And um, you know the 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 uh, Greek uh, Greece took advantage, but all, not just Greece, but uh, Greek American activists took advantage. Armenian American activists took advantage uh, as as uh, more and more as as human rights started creeping more and more into U.S. foreign policy decisions. There were NGOs that were taking shots at at, at Turkey, rightly or wrongly. Uh, later on, you had falling out with the Obama administration um, uh, and, uh, and also, of course, within conservative, within conservative circles in the United States with folks who, were, um, who, saw, Tur who saw Turkish leadership as being uh, overly sympathetic or empowering uh, Muslim Brotherhood activities. So, uh, so, so, Israel, so Israel was able to respond to these overtures. It wasn't that Israel was necessarily, uh, you, know, you know, there was mutual benefit here. Um, I wouldn't necessarily say that the, that the relationship with Greece is, uh, is, is, uh, is going to be a game changer on, on economic issues. I think Sigurd points out how Really, it's the Gulf that's the uh, that's that's so monumental in that regard. But Israel has um, has an opportunity on the strategic side um, to, um, um, in other words, has benefited on the strategic side. And perhaps most important of all is that by forging close ties to Greece and to Cyprus. This is less of it, it's some degree. It's not even so much about Turkey, right? It's about relationships. Um, with the European Union. And if Greece and, and, and South Cyprus, because of its EU membership um, since, since, uh, you know, since, uh, since the end of the, the last decade, I'm sorry, the end of the previous, the decade before, uh, you know, has the ability uh, to stymie a lot of uh, EU interference on um, issues closer to home, like for example, with the Palestinians. So um, I'm not sure how I'm doing so much on time. I will, I will point out that, that there is an opportunity right now, just as there was an opportunity um, on the Syria issue, uh, where is, as, long as, as long as we could, um, as long as Israel could um, stay clear of, of interfering on the issue of the PKK YPG issue, uh, there were important there were important equities that both sides had in Syria where they could work together. I think today we see opportunities. Granted, it's not so much Eastern Mediterranean; it's the South Caucasus, where both Israel and Turkey have interests in ensuring that that there is a a strong um, independent Azerbaijan that is able to uh, stand against Iran. Um, and the hope is that um, that there will be peace, that there will, or, or, or the frozen conflict will 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 freeze over yet again, and um, and, uh, and and that Israel and, and Turkey can work to ensure that uh, again that that uh, that the oil flows from 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 Baku, um, and that uh, and that there is a a, a an overwhelmingly Shia. Uh, country in the region that can stand as a counterweight to uh, to the mullahs in Tehran. So I'll, I, I'll be happy uh, to to address anything that I that I missed or anything that I might not have explained particularly clearly. But again, I thanks I thank uh, Deepan for this opportunity. Uh, thank you, Mr. Epstein.
uh, you very well informed us for the uh, common interest and the common issues between especially Turkey and Israeli and in regional and both uh, inter-regional issues. Uh, and also you defined us uh, Israeli foreign policies Uh, foreign policy is action based on the, the state interest and the, the, the positions and, the, and they are seeking the uh, maneuver capacities and uh, we know uh, the common interest with a special I, I, I want to mention about uh, we know the common interests between Turkey and, and Israel but the, and also it, it shows us our uh, Turkey's and Israel's uh, economic growing economic uh, potential is uh, year by year shows us the two countries has uh, many mutual things. And also you mentioned about the, the, the Azerbaijan's uh, oil reserves is uh, it passing through the Turkey through the, to the Israel is a, is a strategic oil uh, axis is a strategic oil line and also it, it carries uh, some economic interest and also indirectly the political interest. Uh, but on the other side, uh, we will talk in the second uh, section, I, I, I will ask you to some, some uh, unmutualities and some, some, some conflicts about in, in based on the, the, the geopolitical issues. Uh, and for example, it's, it's, it's just an example, and we will talk uh, the, the, the status of the, the, the Harhabite um, Temple Mount in, in Aqsa, whatever you say, and, and in, in some issues in the West Bank, or the, 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 the Turkey is supporting thesis and Israel is supporting thesis, and we will talk, uh, inshallah, in the second re, uh, section. Uh, Professor uh, Ahmed Qasim, uh, he is the uh, one of the most uh, significant and uh, distinguished professors in Turkey in the discipline of the international relations. Uh, welcome, sir. Uh, we are expecting uh, from you to to uh, illustrate and address the main uh, possible uh, future perspective based on. Middle, uh, based on Eastern Mediterranean region uh, for Israel, for Turkey, and the other counterparts of the region. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Inajun. Thanks, Dipam, for this uh, organization uh, with its international scope at the heart of the days of the pandemic. I think this is uh, a much needed contribution to the debate. I also would like to thank uh, Mr. Nobaya for his kind words uh, and to you, of course, for um, uh, introducing yours truly as one of the most prominent professors. I don't know if I am one of the most prominent professors, but I, of course, hope to be one of the prominent students of what is happening uh, around our uh, country and in this region. Uh, I would like to pick up on where uh, Mr. Epstein has left uh, in uh, the introduction part, if I may, uh, of his uh, presentation. Mr. Epstein uh, drew our attentions, uh, not uh, without uh, utmost, I would say, uh, importance to uh, the tie between Turkish-Israeli relations and Israeli-Palestinian issues. Uh, as a matter of fact, uh, it is true that these two have a very close correlation. And it is also worthwhile to note that these relations and their impact on Turkish-Israeli relations, I mean, the issues between uh, Israel and Palestine and Uh, their impact on Turkish-Israel relations is not something new. It's not uh, a matter of the past two decades that JDP is in power, as some would like to think. Uh, that is not so. 
as uh, has been noted uh, after the Oslo Accords, the two countries were in a position which they exploited to improve their relations at the strategic level. Uh, and as I said, they did so. Uh, nowadays, we are not there. Uh, although I do agree with uh, her uh, uh analysis that uh, Palestinians are not completely left out of uh, what is happening uh, between uh, the Gulf countries and Israel. Uh, it is also true that uh, with the stance of the current American administration, uh, the Palestinian issue is at best subordinated to other Arab-Israeli uh, relations. And uh, current American administration's approach to uh, the Middle East. Uh, and I would say that that situation doesn't help Turkish-Israel relations. And as long as, because you wanted me, Selim, to, con con uh, to, to comment on uh, the future of these relations, uh, I would tell you that as long as this is the case, I think uh, Turkish-Israel relations will have a hurdle there, which they should meticulously work to, 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 to get over. Uh, and I would say that I don't anticipate any change uh, in that uh, section uh, of the relations uh, between Turkey and Israel very soon, because I do not expect that uh, Israeli-Palestinian uh, issues would uh, have a better uh, plateau to, to, to rest in the near future. This is not to say that Israel cannot improve its relations with, uh, with uh, the Palestinian Authority. Uh, actually, uh, the UAE-Bahrain uh, agreement does have some uh, clauses that could actually improve or help improve Israel's relations with the Palestinian Authority. But I am also sure that uh, these improvements will be considered minor by uh, elements of uh, Palestinian, by other elements, that is, of Palestinian body politics. And as long as Turkey's interests and uh, relations with these groups remain strong, and for the foreseeable future, I would anticipate them to stay strong, uh, I do not think that Turkey would uh, actually alter its stance uh, on that front. Uh, as a matter of fact, uh, the, the same, of course, uh, subject to different dynamics, applies to uh, the other area that Turkey and Israel could improve their relations, which is the Eastern Mediterranean aspect of the relations. Uh, Israel is a member of the Eastern Mediterranean Gas Forum, where Turkey is decidedly left out. Uh, and uh, the Eastern Med Mediterranean conundrum is something that the world actually follows very closely. Of course, the participants and uh, spectators of this panel also are people, uh, I'm sure, who are interested in that. Uh, in, in the developments on that front. Too. Uh, I'm not going to get into the detail of uh, what is happening uh, because we, we more or less are all aware of what is happening. The thing there is, uh, I think the thing to note uh, pertaining to the future of uh, Turkish-Israel relations is how would uh, Israel and Turkey uh, come to terms uh, with the fact that Turkey is not uh, and I would like to emphasize and underline this, Turkey is not going to, to be okay uh, with any arrangement that would uh, somehow accommodate the Greek and Greek Cypriot claims on the Eastern Mediterranean maritime zones. Uh, I would not expect that Israel uh, would support the Greek and Turk uh, Greek Cypriot position uh, forcefully. Although on the diplomatic front, uh, Israel surely will not have anything against those. Uh, it is not going to materially, if I may, support that position, in my opinion. And as long as that is the case, I think it, that is going to be, that would, in, in and of itself, would be enough to uh, somehow isolate 
uh, tensions uh, there and uh, would not uh, lead to any escalation in the bilateral relations with uh, Turkey or Israel. But uh, as long as uh, these relations are impacted from what is happening in the Eastern Mediterranean, that also is in the current state of things at least, that also is not much to improve on that front too. Less, I have to point out, uh, that we also have to note that there is this debate in Turkey uh, amongst uh, experts and former and current decision makers on how Turkey could de-alienate uh, its uh, maritime uh, control areas with Israel. By that, what I try to mean is this. We all know about the Turkish-Libya agreement, and we know the principles on which it is based. I would like to remind uh, our listeners, our viewers, that uh, this solution was actually not original to Turkey uh, and its uh, maritime zone delimitation uh, issues with uh, Libya. When proposed for the first time in 2012, uh, this very same solution, the scheme and the principles that applies to it, was originally proposed for delimitation of maritime zones between Turkey and Israel. Uh, in 2012, in an article that he penned at uh, a, a, an academic journal, uh, Admiral, uh, who is retired right, right now, uh, Jihad Yaiji, then a colonel, had laid out a plan for uh, delimitation of maritime uh, zones of control between Turkey and Israel, which makes Turkey and Israel actually uh, neighbors over these maritime zones. That those same principles are used to delimit the Libya-Turkey uh, agreement uh, is something that, as I said, should be underlined and noted. There is always, in another uh, sense, there is always room for Turkey and Israel to sit down and come up with a new delimitation agreement between those two parties, which would largely benefit Israel, uh, although this seems like a far-fetched opportunity from where we look right now. But uh, I would like to say that there are, in my opinion, still Turkish decision makers who are very much interested in realizing that kind of a delimitation between Turkey and Israel. Uh, I mean, just you just have to contrast what is done with Libya uh, from northeast to southwest uh, and apply to Turkish areas in the northwest to Israeli areas in the southeast. Uh, for that to be done, for that to be done, of course, another country should be definitely included in that uh, arrangement, which is Egypt. Under the current conditions, it is not easy for Turkey to do that. But if you look at uh, the uh, latest declarations from Turkish Minister of Foreign Affairs and Turkish President Erdogan, you would see that there is some leeway, or at least there are signs of what might be a, called a leeway for those relations too. I do not expect personally drastic change in those relations uh, between Turkey and Egypt, but if they improve, if th those two countries find a way to improve those relations, if Turkey and uh, Egypt can uh, lend a helping help to each other on that front, uh, I believe that Turkish-Israel relations will also be saved of much pressure, and that is going to facilitate Turkish-Israeli relations in a better way, too. Uh, of course, domestic politics is all politics to consider at times. And uh, again, when it comes to Turkish-Israeli relations, this rule uh, doesn't change. Uh, 
and we have to be mindful of that. Uh, the current Israeli prime minister and current Turkish president doesn't share the best of loves for each other, to say the least. And uh, if in Israel uh, a change of government had happened, or if it happens in the near future, uh, at least to enable the Turkish decision makers to save face domestically for improving relations with Israel, I think that at least uh, diplomatic relations could be heightened one or two levels up, and that would be enough or more than enough to improve Israeli-Turkish relations. But as long as the current governments are in place in both countries, I think that is also a probability, which is always there, but very hard to experience. That leaves us with A, the global balances to consider, B, the Caucasian, uh, the, the, the Caucasus uh, conundrum uh, as two areas uh, that Turkey and Israel could help each other or be at least uh, able to hold diplomatic relations that does not uh, cross their paths with each other. Uh, in the Caucasus, what Mr. Epstein has said is valid for me too. I think he was right on mark when uh, he said that uh, this is an area that Turkey and Israel can cooperate. Uh, and in my opinion and observation, do cooperate, even though silently. Uh, they both back Azerbaijan. Uh, and uh, they do it with material support. And that is very, very important at different levels, of course, in different shapes, but that is the case. Uh, which proves further that these two countries does, independent of who is ruling them, ruling them respectively, they do uh, share common interests. Uh, actually, in uh, the early 1990s, I think I was one of the first people to write about how important improving strategic relations between Turkey and Israel were. And uh, I think that the point that I made has proven right uh, in, during that decade and even into the 2000s, early 2000s. Uh, and I would still say that uh, in principle, Turkey and Israel does are two countries who, who does share, uh, who do share uh, interests at the global level. Uh, to start with the regional level, those two countries both are uh, very well positioned to benefit from regional peace and stability. The improving uh, uh, commercial relations between uh, the two, despite everything that is happening on the political front, uh, following cost led and uh, despite what has happened with Mavi Marmara, so on and so forth, is uh, further proof of that. And also globally, I think those two countries still are uh, very much uh, invested in, uh, despite everything that is happening domestically there, and I can improve on that point if anybody cares to ask, uh, but these two countries are still uh, countries which are uh, actually deeply vested in the current world order, which the owner of the current world order, the United States is reluctant to sustain. Uh, and despite that uh, is still sustained, uh, even though ailingly uh, works for the interests of those two countries too. Any instability happening at the global level will have adverse effects on those two countries, on the, the, the both countries, uh, I mean, Israel and Turkey. So uh, both countries do have, uh, would, would unwillingly or willingly, doesn't matter, find themselves on the same side of that equation. I don't think that the East versus West or the Eurasianist versus uh, Occidentalists kind of uh, a, a debate in Turkey is winnable by anyone that is uh, taking a Eurasian stance. The country's current economic relations and the current uh, global economic and financial order doesn't permit that to happen. 
Uh, and in the uh, aftermath of the pandemics, I am not sure if China will be able to improve on its designs uh, globally. So these two countries will still remain, uh, in my opinion, uh, with, firmly within the flock of the Western world order proponent group. And that also uh, will maintain uh, grounds for those two countries to, uh, to improve their relations or uh, at worst refrain from denting them even further. Ideological differences aside, uh, for a, a very uh, long period to come, at least for two, three decades to come, I would believe that uh, these dynamics will still be ruling the relations of those two countries. And I am not sure if we are going to, as a final remark, I'm not sure if we are going to uh, be able to see those days again, uh, but there will always be a rationale to talk about uh, in, uh, in, in, in this, or on the subject of improving Turkish-Israeli relations. Uh, independent of whatever might be uh, the zeitgeist of the time that we are addressing these issues. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Kasım Han. Uh, actually, uh, we took many questions about uh, what will be the steps for normalizing uh, relationship between Turkey and Israel. And actually, your whole speech uh, was the the answer of these questions. Uh, I will I will skip for uh, to 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 ask you to these questions because you already mentioned about a lot the the current status of uh, Israeli and Turkey relations and also uh, Israel and Turkey positions within the uh, global uh, within the global powers. Uh, actually, uh, while we are starting the second uh, phase and second chapter of our uh, webinar, I want to start with you uh, for the, 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 the inter-regional perspective. And we know, and also uh, my, uh, my doctoral studies home uh, in, in China, We know that China is a rising figure in Africa and Middle East. And you mentioned about the, the current status quo in the, in, in the world politics. Uh, the China trying to penetrate both in Gulf region and the Eastern Mediterranean. And also Israel has a significant place in the, the, the China's investments. And also is a Turkey is a part of the uh, brand new Belt and Road Initiative. And we know that uh, while China is continuing to, to integrate this region uh, in, in, uh, for both Gulf, both Israel and for, for, for Turkey, and U.S. has an objections, maybe our participant from the USA can also uh, comment for this issue. But I want to start you because you, you uh, underlined the issues, the current status of the world powers and the, the, the two state positions in, in, in the, among the these powers. And what will you see, the, for example, Israel has an many Chinese investments uh, and they're all, they're all uh, directly related, related with the Eastern Mediterranean. And uh, China has, uh, I'm sorry, Israel has Israel uh, has an option to, to become an independent, in, in the independent uh, regional power from the U.S. foreign policies. Can you explain a little bit? Well, uh, I would, if I figured you out correctly, I would tell you that uh, <clears throat> the Chinese uh, interest in global politics uh, is there to stay, independent of whether or not China uh, will be able to fully realize its uh, One Belt, One Road initiative. And Israel uh, is a very, very important uh, regional hub for, uh, I mean, everyone is a hub in this region for something, but Israel is a hub for technology. And that is, uh, I would say, admiringly, that is a very strong position that Israel holds. And I would say that 
uh, in its quest for developing its independent high-tech value-added economy, Israel might be, might have been, uh, I know, I hope that it is not might have had been, but might have been uh, a, a very, very strong partner for Turkey. Uh, and I think that uh, this is still the case. If you remember what was happening in 1990s, late 1990s, uh, and in the, during the first decade, largely of 2000s, that was, uh, that was the case. Uh, that would make Israel uh, uh, definitely a target for uh, China to improve its relations. Uh, however, uh, I would say that uh, this requires diversity uh, or one might say, one might say that this requires diversity. And I would tell you that Israeli foreign policy doesn't lack that diversity. Mm -hmm. If you remember what is happening in Syria and how Turkish, uh, how, sorry, how Israeli Russian relations reacted to that, uh, I would say that Israel was very successful in accommodating Russia and garnering Russian support uh, in that instance too. Uh, when it comes to the US-Israeli relations, uh, I think that the US-Israeli relations are, uh, I mean, the, the low point in US-Israeli relations but probably was the Obama era. I don't think that anything worse than that would happen to uh, US-Israeli relations, even though uh, probably the next un-Trump administration uh, is not going to, to be as accommodating uh, to Israeli far right uh, as it has been uh, today. Uh, I would tend to think that the, the uh, US support to Israel's policies would still remain the same uh, at, its, at least when it comes to its fundamentals in the foreseeable future too. Uh, Israel's problem, I would say, is uh, not so much so with those uh, singular great powers, China, Russia, or the United States, but uh, rather with the multiplicity uh, great power, which is the EU. Uh, without England included uh, in the EU fray, I think that Israel will find it increasingly harder to be popular in uh, in the EU, and I wouldn't uh, expect Israeli-EU relations to improve drastically again in the uh, foreseeable uh, future. Uh, so this is how I see the uh, Israeli uh, relations with the global system. How would they develop? Uh, how would they transform? Not much. Uh, as I said, I don't expect much improvement on the EU side, even though when it comes to, if the push comes to show, if I may, uh, the, the European Union is not going to take a, a, a determiningly anti-Israeli position, in my opinion. As I said, in the US, nothing worse than the Obama era would uh, be uh, part of our experience in my anticipation of how things would develop. And with Russia too, Israel will still uh, uh, preserve cordial relations. There are, of course, black swan events, if I may, that might uh, alter that situation. Uh, a, uh, a regional intra-Arab war based on sects or based on interests might alter that, uh, that position. I don't expect this to happen. Uh, so there is little probability on that. Uh, and there is also little probability of uh, another uh, potentially decidingly interrupting development, which is uh, a larger peer war in uh, Eastern Mediterranean. But even a very small skirmish can create an environment where uh, these relations uh, between the global system and Israel might be impacted. But then again, such a skirmish will, imp uh, will uh, be uh, detrimental to uh, the relations of the regional powers, Turkey or others, 
with the global system at such a level that the disimprovement of Israelis, Israel's relations with the global system wouldn't matter much uh, relatively, even under such a scenario. Uh, and Israel's preference, even though it would be more than happy to use Chinese money to develop its uh, high tech uh, yeah. uh, or startup na nation uh, status, uh, Israel's preferences will not be much different from uh, what it is doing right now in the uh, foreseeable future. The greater changes might happen in Turkish preferences. Well, and let me conclude on that note. Thank you, Professor, for your uh, precious comments. And we took also many questions which direct think to which which directs to uh, Mr. Epstein, uh, I think our audiences uh, like you very well. And also, I, I, I have a question for you, uh, as I mentioned before, uh, in, in the, uh, about the geopolitical dispute between uh, Turkey and Israel. You can also uh, give an example or the, the trying to mention about them and also uh one 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 person uh, asked uh what can you say about to uh, israel and palestinian uh, relations in the eastern mediterranean especially based on the economic zone the because we uh, as a, as a, as an ordinary turkish people per, per, people uh, i i can talk about that when and the, the turkish people saw a palestinian delegates on the uh, Mediterranean, East Mediterranean Economic Forum uh, and trying to be uh, shocked because and he, uh, he can or she can uh, think that uh, is, is there uh, is any uh, mutuality between the Israel and Palestine, especially the, the arranging the zone uh, divisions. Could you explain uh, the, the, the main situation in, in, in is uh, Israel between uh, the main situation between Israel and Palestine in the East Mediterranean? Well, uh, let me see if I can if I can answer to to the question uh, to the satisfaction of the individual uh, posing the question. Um, look, I mean Israel Israel is certainly providing uh, is looking to provide natural gas to. Um, you know, inside the Palestinian territories and uh, to uh, other neighbors like Egypt and, and, and Jordan. Um, you know, the, the, I, I'd like to throw some cold water on, um, on the, this whole uh, Eastern Mediterranean gas forum and, and some of these pipeline discussions. Um, you look, it's, it, it's, it's wonderful talk. We heard talk about an Israeli pipeline going to Turkey, a gas pipeline, you know, stemming from Tamar and Leviathan, those oil finds in the Eastern Mediterranean. Um, but we, you know, it conveniently left out the disputes with Lebanon, with, with potentially with Greek Cyprus, with South Cyprus. And now, of course, we're having similar conversations about potential pipelines to, that extend all the way to Italy. Um, while we still have these 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 territorial uh, disputes, these these maritime these maritime disputes, and then of course it doesn't even take into account the economics of gas pipelines. Um, I know I I can't claim to be a an, a hydrocarbon expert, but you can't compare. I do know that you can't compare oil to natural gas. Um, natural gas isn't fungible the way oil is. And it's unclear uh, whether there's COVID or whether we're living in a COVID society or not living in a COVID society. It's, it's, it's decidedly unclear that a gas pipeline is, economic, uh, is economical, even if you can get all the countries in the region, uh, not just Israel, Greece, Egypt, South Cyprus, but even if you include Turkey, if you can, um, if, if, even if there is unanimity on these issues, uh, it's unclear that pipelines are going to be built. Uh, I, I've heard discussion about, about pipeline uh, st uh, stretching from the Gulf into Israel. Uh, you know, if, that, that, that is certainly, certainly a possibility, but even that has um, high economic costs. 
Jason, can um, I say something? Can I say yeah. something? Jump in right there. Please. Um, the pipelines between the Gulf and Israel are already in place. Um, I just want to make that as a correction, um, which is why the real strategic environment between Israel and the Gulf states has been uh, materializing. So yeah, sorry about that. Yeah, they do. Ah, no, 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 no problem. Actually, and uh, Mr. Nobauer, I, 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 I want to thank you because the next question. Uh, you you asked for the, our next question. Is there any pipeline projects from from the East Med to to Gulf region? From this side, thank you so much. I mean, you know, yeah, so, yeah there are. You can further correct you can further correct me, but my understanding is it's not simply a turnkey process, though. It's 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 there are uh, there are significant expenses. But I think what, what this goes to show is that is, again, that's something involving the Gulf, not the Eastern Mediterranean. Um, as Dr. Han mentioned earlier, Funny. as Dr. Han mentioned, mentioned earlier, uh, you know, EU, you know, for both Turkey and, and, and for Israel, uh, the EU presents a challenge uh, for, you know, they all, uh, each, each one has its own dynamic. But as I, uh, I pointed out in the in, in earlier, Israel Israel can utilize Greece, uh, South Cyprus, Italy, uh, Italy uh, not to mention the countries of Eastern Europe, to stymie some of the more um, uh, onerous um, uh, policies, uh, or at least uh, uh, policies that Israel deems onerous when it comes to uh, when it comes to Brussels. So. Um, I, 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 I didn't. I didn't really discuss energy in my initial presentation, other than to talk about Azerbaijan. Um, but I do think it's important. I, you know, I agree with Brenda Schaefer, uh, noted energy uh, expert uh, at Georgetown University, who, um, who 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 thinks it was was a, a, a grave mistake to leave Turkey out of this Eastern Mediterranean gas forum. Uh, but I think the, the larger I think the larger point uh, the larger point is that is that we're having all these conversations, and yet just as the the Israel Turkey plans to to push an underwater an undersea pipeline were you know, encountered so many obstacles. I think nothing it, it, it's not much different now with different players involved. It's, it's, I think it's the more more feasible to, to be uh, constructing an underwater pipeline between Israel and, and Turkey, uh, I, I, I guess, and I, I read about it. And the feasible than the ISMET is the long pipeline projects and the also American companies which want to carry these projects push to Israeli government, please solve the political issues. Right, but you still need, mar but you still need markets. And it's unclear that even that while the logistics of an Israel-Turkey pipeline are perhaps uh, easier to comprehend than one that stretches all the way to, to the Italian peninsula, uh, there were still questions being asked about whether it could compete financially uh, with Russian gas, for example. So, uh, you know, the, the, there are hard questions, there are hard questions that need to be asked, and and, and we have, we need to distinguish uh, from the uh, diplomatic optimism with, uh, with 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 the numbers that 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 can be manipulated, but still don't lie. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh, thank you, Mr. Epstein. Thanks for your uh, answers and fruitful comments for us. Uh, at this time. Mr. Nobauer, yes, uh, I want to talk with you to Iran, Iran issues. Yeah. Uh, will do you think is there any opportunity? And we we, we saw the the parties of the Gulf region, uh, which are uh, collaborating with the uh, with the Israel, coordinating with the Israel against to to uh, Iran's and political and, and military uh, expansions. In the in the regions, um, do you see any any uh, opportunities against the Iran with uh, against Iran uh, between Turkey and Israel or Turkey and Gulf regions? 
and and I know the, the one of the most most significant figure is uh, Qatar in 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 that situation because we we saw the Qatar's position uh, in the mediation between the Hamas and Israel uh, two two weeks ago and uh, also the Saudi Arabia and Qatar starting to dialogue uh, to to normalization we we know some some developments but uh, what firstly what will the situation of the Qatar in the Gulf region against the Iran's position then uh, does it trigger the Turkey's uh, position against the Iran and also is there any opportunity uh, the, the, this situation makes an opportunity to uh, to normalization uh, of the ties between Turkey and Israel. Well, I think I think the first the the, the first thing that we have to acknowledge is that um, within the Gulf region, the uh, Arab states are divided amongst themselves. There are various inter-Gulf disputes um, that are taking place, and in this context. The struggle is within the Arabian Peninsula as opposed to between the Gulf states and Iran. Uh, we know that uh, all of the Gulf states, um, their official position is that they, they, they're willing to accommodate uh, Iran to a certain point, including the UAE, by the way. Um, I think the, 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 the Gulf state that has the hardest position uh, against Iran is Saudi Arabia. We, we have to remember that it was only last year that the Iranians launched a sophisticated military attack against uh, Saudi Arabia's critical oil infrastructure. Um, and and that, was, that was something that nobody wants to talk about right now, but, but it's something that is on everybody's mind. Um, as far as the other Gulf states are concerned, the five, the five others, uh, UAE, uh, Oman, Bahrain, or Bahrain to a lesser extent, but UAE, uh, Qatar, uh, Kuwait, uh, and Oman, they, they all have uh, pragma uh, pragmatism. They have pragmatic relationships with Iran. And um, of course, the United States is its uh, principal security guarantor. And this is also why the uh, Trump administration, to its credit, has uh, uh, fought so hard to resolve the crisis in the Gulf because uh, the Trump administration's policy is to bring Israel and the Gulf states uh, together um, as a strategic bloc uh, and um, <clears throat> strengthen economic ties and, of course, isolate Iran diplomatically. That is the strategic objective of the Trump administration. So from that point of view, the Trump administration will continue to, to, to do what it can to, uh, to resolve tensions, inter-Gulf tensions. Um, I, and, and I would add that, uh, that uh, Israel um, and Turkey, for different reasons, have also played critical roles in stabilizing this inter-Arab struggles. Um, I would argue that, uh, that these inter-Arab struggles have really sucked out a lot of diplomatic energy from the Trump administration and certainly from the Turks to the point where there is really no there's very little opportunity and there's certainly no political trust among the Gulf states to align together and to confront Iran. So this is a, this is a window of opportunity that has been closed. It's a, it's a strategic mistake in my view, um, the Gulf crisis, um, because it closed that window, uh, perhaps not permanently, but for the foreseeable future. So, um, so you will hear a lot of rhetoric um, about confronting Iran, but, but in reality, they, there's, there's really no evidence uh, for that. The United States is the one that is confronting Iran. You can agree or disagree with the present uh, US position, but it's very clear that the maximum pressure campaign is working. Uh, Iran is weaker economically. Um, it's isolated more in the region. Um, and, and as far as Turkey is concerned, I think that um, Turkey has been taken by surprise, I think, um, at least judging by official statement, by, by, by the very close cooperation between Israel and the Gulf states. Uh, I, I would say that the exception to that, of course, is, is Kuwait. We, we're all familiar with the Kuwaiti position, so I don't have to go into that. 
but I think I think that that's the new political reality. I think I think the this, this, the challenges in this environment, in this geopolitical environment, is that m many of the conflicts, whether it's within the Gulf or whether it is uh, between Turkey and let's say uh, Egypt, is based on conf uh, conflict between the leaders of these various countries, as opposed to strategic differences. So I'll, I'll leave it at that. Yeah. Okay, Mr. Nobova, can I add some uh, one one question? Uh, I will ask you to also. Uh, what will the Chinese position, both in Gulf and Israel, uh, in the perspective to, of the U.S. Uh, China, will China be a trade a trade level as like as the Iran, according to U.S. in the Gulf and also Eastern Mediterranean? Or uh, what will the uh, Gulf regions countries and also Israel, also Israel's positions against the China? Could you briefly uh, explain something about that? Well, let me put it this way. Um, even Democrats here in the United States, they will reluctantly admit that President Trump was right when it comes to confronting China on the global, uh, on the global scale. I think that President Trump has changed um, how Americans view China and uh, the competition that China presents, um, including in the Gulf and in the Eastern Mediterranean. And I think from, from an American perspective, irrespective of who wins in November, I think um, efforts will be made to keep China out of the Gulf region and, uh, and out of the Mediterranean. Uh, you may recall that uh, uh, Secretary of State Mike Pompeo was in Israel um, early on during the pandemic where he laid down red markers against uh, Chinese, China's involvement in, in Israel. So, so the, the Trump administration has made that position very clear. The Trump administration has also made that position very clear to the Gulf states. Um, and, uh, and the Gulf states, of course, and this is, this is why, why I keep coming back to the Gulf crisis, because the Gulf crisis has eroded all trust within the Gulf Corporation Council. Um, and, and it was for that reason that it was so important uh, to, re, uh, to get the diplomatic process going so that you don't open up the door for China, Russia, or Iran into the Gulf region. Um, and that could easily have happened if, if, if there was no swift U.S. diplomatic efforts um, to, uh, uh, to, 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 to prevent any sort of military actions uh, against Qatar. Uh, so, so, uh, so the struggle against China will continue. How it will play out, I think, will have a lot to do with uh, the combination of factors. Uh, one of them will be uh, the U.S. role in the world, um, whether or not we will see more isolationism potentially, or segments of isolationism, or matter whether or not we will see an effort to revitalize multilateral diplomacy under a potential Biden administration, we, we don't quite know as of yet. Okay, thank you, Mr. Nobarver. Uh, I just want to ask a, just one tough question. Uh, I'm, I'm uh, uh, sorry about it, I'm taking your time. I'm just curious about it. Uh, is there any end of the honeymoon between the Israel and the Arab Emirates, especially? Um, let, let, let me give you an example. Do you think uh, will any Gulf countries or the M any, any Emirates decision makers uh, will uh, has a tendency to recognize uh, Jerusalem as a capital of the Israel or something uh, like these political uh, tough issues for the the, the, the Muslim people? Uh, do you have any any perspective about to uh, feature of this normalization. Well, I think I think that the normalization is taking place, and I think that one of the reasons that the Gulf states are moving in that direction and uh, is that all of them uh, have had positive experiences with Israel, and that Israel has been a reliable strategic partner. This is very important. Um, you know. Um, in our own here in the United States, we have seen a little bit of a uh, zigzagging between President Bush, Obama, 
and uh, and and Trump. Um, but Israel has been consistent as a reliable strategic partner, and this is this is something that needs to be acknowledged. Uh, we can go into a um, ideological debate of the Palestinian issue, or, or or who is to be blamed for 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 the lack of progress on that front. And and people will certainly have that opinion, and I think that it's important to acknowledge that the Palestinian issue is. Is, a, is an issue that is easy to manipulate for geopolitical gain. We have seen that, and it will continue to be that going forward. But uh, we have to be very honest. The reasons the Gulf states are moving closer to Israel is that they have a reliable and positive relationship with them, um, including um, during crisis. And Israel, um, and I have, I have studied now Gulf-Israel relations for a very long time and seen how it plays out during crisis. And Israel, to its credit, is, um, is not demanding a client-state relationship um, with the smaller Gulf countries. And this is why the United States and Britain uh, before Israel uh, were so valuable strategic partners, because um, it deals with these small Gulf countries based on, on principles of sovereignty, as opposed to trying to um, have a forge a client state relationship with them. Okay, thank you, sir. Thanks for your fruitful uh, comments about it. Mr. Jehun uh, Chichekci, dear doctor, uh, you are last but not least. Uh, I'm sorry you waited alone, but uh, I hope we will make a, a great conclusion with you. And we heard from you the general situation in the Eastern Mediterranean region based on uh, the triangle of Israel, Turkey, and Greece. And also you mentioned about the East Med, but uh, I'm really curious about the status of the Russia in the Eastern Mediterranean region and also uh, the how Turkey and Palestinian relations affect the uh, Turkey's position in the Eastern Mediterranean region. And after you completed these uh, comments, I can also ask, but I have to, I have to read uh, one question to you from our uh, audiences. Uh, someone asked uh, that, could the rapprochement of Israel and China be interpreted as an Israel preference for the economy over security, despite the Israel's collective security with USA in the region. And I guess he, he, uh, he thought that you mentioned about security based policies of the Israel a lot. And uh, also we mentioned about the Israel and the Chinese economic based policies. Also the Chinese policies in the Middle East also uh, seems like economies is nowadays uh, based on the economy. Uh, and can you uh, can you co co uh, co can you cooperate the issues with uh, economic and security issues, which is the most important for the Israel economy or or, or security in the region? Security. <laughs> Let me start uh, with your first question, Salim. Okay. Uh, the Russian positions in the uh, East Met uh, is uh, is, a, is a part of also Israeli foreign policy. In, uh, we we know that uh, Benjamin Netanyahu and also Vladimir Putin uh, met uh, lots of times, uh, and uh, especially in in the Syrian territory, they uh, they they got an uh, agreement uh, to to. To free the uh, Israeli Israeli aircrafts to have operations on there. Uh, now we can say uh, with uh, Russian presence in uh, Western Syria, uh, in Tartus, uh, for example, uh, we can we can say that uh, East East Med is also uh, a, a playground uh, for Russia also, uh, and. Turkey's relations with Russia uh, and also Israel's relations with, uh, with Russia is also uh, uh, um, is is um, is di directing the uh, 
regional politics. The Russian presence here is, is, so, is, is so important, I think. And uh, the Palestinian cause, uh, Palestinian issue, also a, a part of Israeli foreign policy in, in East Med because of the uh, Gazan coastline. Uh, you know, uh, there, there, there are uh, Gaza reserves uh, a few miles away from the coastline of the Israel and also the Gaza uh, coastline. Uh, but uh, we cannot we cannot uh, talk about it uh, before a Palestinian statehood uh, come into uh, reality. Uh, now, uh, Abraham Accords, you know, uh, Abraham Accords uh, offer a, 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 a unjust uh, statehood to the Palestinians with the uh, with uh, with the annexation of the Jewish settlements in the West Bank. Uh, but uh, when we uh, have the Palestinian state in East Med uh, under under Al Fatah or, or Hamas rule. Uh, it doesn't matter for us uh, because the Turkish uh, position in Palestinian cause uh, is so uh, solidified. Uh, under any rule, uh, when uh, a Palestinian statehood in uh, coming to reality, there uh, we can talk about uh, the maritime delimitation. Uh, agreements maybe between Turkey and Palestine, and also I would like to add some words uh, to the to the Turkish Israel relations. Uh, uh, also, the uh, our other speakers have uh, had some words on 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 this topic. Uh, I, I I I can't I cannot uh, agree with them because uh, they, they, I think they are uh, uh, they are uh, hopeless spoke. They they spoke hopefully. Because uh, the Turkish-Israel relations uh, relate uh, on uh, bas basically uh, the common threats. Uh, for example, for example, in uh, 2016, uh, President Erdogan uh, expressed his uh, need, his country's need to Israel uh, after after a, a six-year uh, uh, rupture in in their relations in their uh, common relations, but uh, President Erdogan and also Turkey uh, expressed expressed his need, uh, his country's need because of the uh, increasing Russian threat against the Turkish presence here uh, after the uh, Russian aircraft was shut down uh, on in Turkish uh, airspace uh, and. This uh, example is so important when we uh, try to understand the Turkish-Israel relations mentality. Uh, in 1990s, uh, a, a similar situation that I uh, first uh, firstly mentioned about it in my uh, presentation, uh, in my main presentation. Uh, in 1990s, it, it's, it's, it's a, it was a similar situation there. Uh, Iran, Syria what were the common threats for Israel and Turkey there. And today, uh, uh, there are no common threats uh, for Turkey and Israel, I think. Turkey uh, uh, is uh, allying uh, with Russia and Iran in many issues, in especially this Syrian case. Uh, and uh, Israel is on the other side. On the other side, and uh, I, I don't, uh, I, 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 I can't say that uh, Israel and Turkey uh, have Commonalities uh, in some cases. For example, also uh, the uh, East Met uh, gas reserves and also the uh, Israel gas reserves to transfer to the European markets. Uh, this this was also a case uh, in uh, 2016, and uh, Turkish uh, Turkish public uh, were uh, was tried to convince uh, to that uh, to that rapprochement to that possible rapprochement between Turkey and Israel in in that line with with the uh, Gaza source and uh, with the uh, Turkish uh, hubness Turk uh, being uh, being a hub Turkish being a hub, uh, but. Uh, Today, uh, we can uh, we can so easily uh, note that uh, without a settlement in S Cyprus issue, Cyprus question, uh, this this is a um, improbable uh, scenario, uh, because uh, if if there would be a 
there would be a pipeline between between the uh, Turkey and Israel. This uh, could uh, this could be um, this could be built up under the water of the uh, so-called uh, Southern Cyprus ec uh, Exclusive Economic Zone, and also. Uh, without an without an settlement in Cyprus question, uh, we cannot talk about uh, a possible uh, common uh, understanding between the Turkey and Israel on ener energy uh, resources and also energy energy uh, transportation. Okay, uh, my words uh, are all uh, all is done. Thank you, uh, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, Doctor Chichekci. Uh... We, we all took your uh, precious comments about the uh, different perspective on the different perspective. And yes, uh, the, this issue has a two face, uh, especially Israel and Turkey relation has two face. And, and, and also it contains some, some opportunities and also it contains some royalties. And these, these, these faces are broadly related uh, directly in regional issues and third party issues. Uh, to all, all precious participants and, and our uh, professors, thanks uh, for participating to our webinars. And lastly, uh, is there anyone to take a speech, a little speech for the conclusion or not? If there is nothing uh, to say about, uh, I have to, I, I have, I have to uh, close this meeting. I will say one thing. Yeah, yeah, sure, sure, please. I think one of the challenges that we're seeing in the, both in the Gulf region and in the, in the Eastern Mediterranean is the unilateralism by certain actors. And um, ultimately, um, in order to bring stability to the Eastern Mediterranean and to the Gulf region, it requires collective security and a sense of collective purpose. And until that is, achieved, unfortunately, we will see much more musical chairs uh, in these two regions that are now connected. And I think it's uh, incumbent on, on the United States as a global power, which has good relationships with all of these actors to ensure that uh, collective security can, uh, can be resolved or can be restored um, as the overall strategic objective and then try to work on try to implement tactical issues that can reduce tensions between the various actors, whether it's in the, in the Eastern Mediterranean or whether it is in the Gulf region. So thank you. And thank you, Mr. Nobauer. If you yeah. don't mind, I'd like to just piggyback. Um, on, of course, of course. Um, Iran and Russia continue, continue to be longer term concerns uh, for different reasons. Uh, and whoever is president of the United States in 2021, whether it's a second Trump term, uh, or if it's uh, President Biden and Vice President Harris, uh, these are, these are um, eventualities that, that, that need to be addressed. Uh, Iran, because of, of, of course, it, uh, it got empowered during the Obama years. And if, if, if the economic uh, sanctions loosen, uh, we could again have some real problems, not just in the Gulf, but of course throughout the Mediterranean and again in Syria. And of course, Russia, uh, not just Ru Russia, uh, Russia's behavior traditionally in the Caucasus, but also Russia now uh, being embedded in Syria, having an influence in the Eastern Mediterranean, perhaps on Cyprus as well. Uh, Russia does not uh, Russia does not profit when we have stability and, 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 and countries get along. Russia profits when there's instability. And right now, Russia and Israel seem to, seem to, get, seem to have come to an understanding in Syria and, to, and, and, and there's still hope perhaps in Turkey that, that, that bilateral ties between Ankara and Moscow will, will uh, remain uh, positive. Uh, but just as easily things could fall apart and Turkey and Israel uh, could find themselves again needing to work very closely together, for example, in Syria uh, to address perhaps uh, what might happen, uh, uh, Russia being an ally of Iran uh, as well. Uh, 
so we, 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 we have to look not just at what's going on in the Aegean or in the Eastern Mediterranean, but also on land as well. Thank you, Epstein. Uh, I, I, I want to thank to all participants, Mr. Epstein and uh, Chichekji and Professor Ahmed Qasim Han and Noah Bayer for participating on behalf of the DIPAM especially for participating in our webinar. Thanks for your uh, and the fruitful comments and the explanations about the uh, Israel-centric Middle Eastern uh, policies and ISMED policies. I hope see you soon in any different uh, platforms uh, e without any pandemic situation. Thanks for all. Have a good evening to US and also to in Turkey right now. And Erev Tov. Inshallah. Thank you. Inshallah. Girushiris. Girushiris. Yes. Later <laughs> out. Okay. Hocam. Tamam, görüşürüz.